So let's um, look at some more details here. So we'll, we'll, what we'll do now is we'll basically use that simple model and we'll try to build an, underst an understanding of the complexity of the environment of the position, starting from land, going all the way to the basin. And so if we start close from land, typically what we have is muddy tidal flats. And here Gene Renke did a lot of work on, again, the Bahamas and those tidal flats. So this is a picture of the facies you can expect in the, uh, in the tidal flats. So you can see we have open marine here um, towards us, then we have some open ponds, we have some low algal marshes, we have mangrove ponds and some marginal inland algal marshes, some inland algal marsh, some high algal marsh, so lo lots of marshes. And of course we have some exposed area which are, which are effectively levy beach deposit. So what's interesting is those tidal flats have tidal channels as you can clearly see on this image here. You have the tidal channels, some levee deposits and some uh, mangroves all around. So let's look at some of this, um, this environment. So at, at first sight, it looks quite complex. So the um, mangrove pond and the levee, levee deposit look something like this. You have these channels where the flow of water is going and in between this you have deposition of sediments. We also see that we have mangrove. Mangroves are very important in terms of uh, environment of deposition in carbonates because they allow to stabilize the, the sediment. And so in these um, muddy deposits, you have mangrove that form a very rich ecosystem and you have this tree growing in very shallow water and essentially fixating sediments and providing nutrients and protection for fish. So this is a very rich environment that unfortunately tends to disappear nowadays. And of course in the open we have these, uh, these ponds but these ponds, you have to understand, are very shallow. We're talking 50 centimeters of water, maybe a meter of water. We're talking really, really shallow water conditions. So quite a complex environment, quite a lot of, of uh, diversity in this environment. And all these channels basically mean that you have a very big patchiness if you look at the meter scale or 10 meter scale or even 100 meter scale uh, distribution of facies laterally in this system. So that's something to keep in mind if you ever work with carbonate system or try to produce from carbonate systems. So now if we move forward into this system closer into the lagoon, again we'll look at a beautiful example of a, of a lagoon. This time I'll take the example from San Salvador. And here in San Salvador, you have um, a, a study that was done looking at the type of deposit you can find in the lagoon. And I think it's really interesting because what you find is patch reef, those are the red points there. There's of course a carbonate sand at the beach, the yellow color. But what I want to point, draw your attention to are the green area, which are seagrass meadows. Seagrass meadows are another one of those really important ecological niche in carbonate uh, system where you can have dugong and other types of organisms really thriving there. So a very, very important ecological niche in the um, lagoon. It's also interesting because those seagrass meadow, not only do you have grass, but you can also have in this, in this uh, shallow water um, condition, so protected by the reef, you can have this particular plant known as Halimeda. Halimeda is a green algae. However, this algae is interesting because it has a calcium carbonate skeleton. And what you're looking at right now is a green Halimeda sitting on top of Halimeda sand. This, this sand here is a carbonate sand. It's made up of plates from this Halimeda plant. Okay, so surprisingly, Halimeda is a very important carbonate producer in modern carbonate system. It really produces a large volume of sediments in the lagoon. So we know it from the Bahamas, but we also know it from other location. And there's been a fantastic study um, done by Marty McNeil on the geometry and distribution of Halimeda bioherms in Australia. 
And what you can see from this really detailed palo uh, bathymetric profile is that those halimeda form halimeda bioherms. And those bioherms, so a bioherm is a concentration of these organisms, those bioherms are very patchy but also self-organized. So they tend to form donut shapes around you know, a, a, an empty center and they're not just mounds, they're actually donut shapes. So you see here the reef protects the, the back reef in Australia. And in the back reef, you can see channels or paleo channels of um, you know, tidal influence channels, perhaps. And the, these uh, points here, all of those represent the Halimeda reef. So again, a lot of complexity here when you look at the, the lagoon. It's not necessarily just a very simple, broad band of deposition as we like to simplify it. So now let's look at the sand that we tend to have around those uh, shallow water conditions as well. Sands can be very, very important. Um, Mitch Harris did a lot of work on this. Um, he formerly from Chevron, because sand, carbonate sand, is one of the top reservoirs for a lot of uh, oil and gas plays. And so if you look at the Great Bahamas Bank, I pointed all these, um, the presence of all of these grain stone. Well, if you look at satellite imagery, like Mitch Harris did, you will see that these sands form nice dunes. So you can see nice prograding dunes with very complex geometries um, and we can look, for instance, at one of those. You can, you can clearly see those elongated dunes. They are uh, elongated in one direction. So that means if you worry about things like um, lateral permeability barriers, for instance, this could be um, a big thing to know is the, the distribution of those sands. And we, we like to use the term geobodies for geological bodies. So these sand geobodies have a very definite orientation and they are about you know, a few meters thick and you can find them all around the island and they're moved by the currents. They're a very significant portion of this system. Here's another beautiful example. So you can see that there, those geobodies have a different dimension. Notice the scale here. We're looking at 20 kilometer here at the, at, uh, the bottom. So the field of view here is roughly 50, 60 kilometers um, across. So a very large area of this uh, Bahamas is covered with those um, sand. And you can even see them exposed here. So those are beautifully exposed sand. And if you look at the detail of those sands, they're mostly made of this oud. So this rounded, very pearl-like carbonate. So for, for a very long time, we assumed that oids were abiotic precipitates. And there's still you know, a lot of debate about this. But if you look at them in cross-section, you can clearly see concentric ring, which shows the growth of the oid. And these oidal sands, again, can form really considerable reservoir in the Middle East and actually everywhere around the world. We'll see some examples um, in the next classes. And I mentioned for a long time we thought they were completely abiotic, but now there is a school of thought that would like to see bacterial or at least algal um, contribution to these formation in, 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 to the precipitation of carbonate in almost everything. So in this case, Mitch Harris looked at the detail of the sediments and he found some tentative um, evidence that maybe you're looking at um, some EPS, so that those are polysaccharides that are known to be associated with bacteria. And some of the grains look very much like bacteria. So the idea is that perhaps bacteria play a role in the precipitation of oid, but of course to get those nice concentric rings you also need agitation. So oidal sands typically are formed in agitated environments.